Good morning, everybody. Happy to have another great grand rounds. I know this is a very exciting one I've had circled in my calendar for a while. Um, I'm Brandon Kennedy, I'm one of the PGY3s. I will be uh, moderating today. Up first, we have Dr. Liang coming to us from New York, um, presenting a case presentation and a review of optic nerve sheath meningioma. Please welcome Dr. Liang. Hey guys, thanks for um, inviting me to these grand rounds to speak. So spent a month um, on the neuroophthalmology um, clinic last month, which was um, really great to see all the pathologies you know, that we see also in the hospital with our patients. So this is one of our patients that um, our neurosurgery team here saw first, and then we, um, Dr. Warner, have followed up in clinic. So I'll just get started. So we have a 45-year-old female who came to us through the ED, presented with seizures, um, it's about like more than six months of headaches, blurry vision, um, and really not any significant history um, that's a concern. Um, we got a scan um, on emission. So you can see this is um, axial scan of T1 with contrast. So you can see here as we're going through that she has multiple meningiomas. Um, notably in the olfactory groove and also in the left sphenoid wing um, that's extending um, into the, into Meckel's cave and um, possibly the carotid sinus. And then you can see here in the crone a little better. Um, we didn't get any optic, um, any or MRI orbits at this time, but um, you can see that kind of a lot of cause of possibly her blurry vision um, is stemming from these, from this obvious compression. She doesn't have any notable family history and she, um, um, her symptoms were relatively benign until she presented to us. So um, she was admitted to actually the Huntsman um, in August. Um, we had ophthalmology come and um, evaluate her. She did have bilateral optic uh, disc edema. That was notable. And then um, we pursued um, resection of the two largest uh, uh, meningiomas that we had seen, or likely meningiomas at that time, the, in the left sphenoid wing um, that was likely causing compression in that region, and then also in the olfactory groove. Um, at that time, um, during the procedure, she didn't... Um, you know, we did an anterior left-sided craniodectomy to resect this left sphenoid wing mass. And um, we had not seen um, grossly any evidence of extension into the um, octave, op optic nerve canal at this time. And um, uh, she had came out of the surgery really nicely, um, came fully intact, which um, we did note that she did have, um, continue to have this new um, six palsy, likely secondary to uh, to uh, the procedure um, that we started to, uh, we followed and um, referred out patient uh, to Dr. Warner. And she did nicely as she left to rehab. So um, when, she re, uh, when she was reevaluated in rehab, she was found again to have this six palsy um, minus four and the bilateral disc edema was improving, which is good. And then this is just um, kind of what, uh, axial images of seeing the uh, before uh, T1 contrast um, before and after. And so um, we got majority of the um, mass out um, with probably some minimal edema at this time. So um, she followed up in clinic um, with us in October in neuro ophthalmology. Um, basically from assessment, she does have, she did have a slight um, 0.3 um, APB um, otherwise, she was pretty much intact, no pressure to her eyes, and her visual fields were full. Um, she did um, have this evidence of uh, um, iso, iso, hyper, um, isotropia um, that was worse on left gaze um, and confirmed on Maddox rod testing objectively, uh, subjectively, but improving um, from, prior to, uh, from when she was with us in, clinic, um, in the OR. In terms of her edema, she um, you know, still had some indistinct margins, but improving from um, from post uh, pre-op. Um, she's 
again, um, her visual fields were pretty good. She did have um, um, on her Humphreys a slightly enlarged blind spot on the left side, but nothing that was too much obstructing um, too much of her visual fields that she could um, really appreciate. So it was much improved again. Now, looking at the scans before in the preoperative MRIs, unfortunately, with no um, evidence of um, or with not getting MRI orbits, you know, we, we couldn't understand or assess whether or not there was true extension into, um, into her um, orbital canal at that time. So we did pursue to get MRI orbits with contrast um, to further assess whether there was extent, secondary extension of the um, meningioma from the left spinoid wing into the canal. Um, so before we kind of go through the her pre-op imaging, just wanted to kind of go over the optic nerve sheath mening meningiomas, which is a very rare, relatively rare diagnosis and um, pathology. Usually the classic triad that you'll see is visual loss, optic atrophy, and um, evidence of retinal choroidal collaterals. So typically this triad, even though it's kind of known, um, the diagnostics for this type of meningioma is not always presented in this fashion. You may have only one or two of these three um, uh, these symptoms. Um, to kind of give you perspective, it's about only one to 2% of all meningiomas that we see. Um, and what's more rare is for you to see a primary um, optic nerve sheath glioma, uh, meningioma. Um, typically, um, if it's primary, it's arising from um, the cap cells of the arachnoid that surrounds the optic nerve itself, and that accounts for about 10% of all orbital meningiomas, so even smaller fraction of what um, optic nerve sheath meningiomas already account for in, um, in the uh, uh, diagnosis. Um, more commonly, we do see it originating uh, intracranially, um, again, when it when we have these olfactory groove or left spe uh, sphenoid wing meningiomas that easily can extend into the um, uh, cavernous sinus and in into also the carotid canal, or uh, the optic canal. Um, here um, from a, a review paper, you can see just for examples, um, what you would see on um, MRI. So on the, um, on the right side here, you can see the primary optic nerve sheath in meningioma and this evidence of um, Hyper, uh, hyper intensity on T1 contrast, basically um, just showing this encapsulation of arachnoid cells growing this uh, primary, uh, primary meningioma versus when you're looking at um, a patient with a known meningioma and you're trying to assess for um, extension into um, optic canal, you can, you know, I would, we would you can typically trace it from the, um, the, uh, the cavernous sinus and then into um, the um, canal itself because you can see it invading. So um, to, to sh kind of also show how difficult it is to actually diagnose this um, pathology when there's not any other obvious signs like uh, having, in this case, having seizures and headaches, um, uh, the group at Emory did do a, a long-term um, re retrospective study on assessing the, um, the delayed di diagnosis of optic nerve sheath meningiomas. And, you know, they've had, um, with 39 patients that were confirmed um, having um, this pathology, it took 70% uh, had about delayed di diagnosis that could be as long as five years. Uh, most commonly, the, this type of error was due to you know, failure to assess um, or pick this up during clinical exam. Um, and then second most um, common error was um, assessing the imaging itself. And a lot of these patients um, that they had diagnosed majority uh, that were misdiagnosed were thought to have optic neuritis. So this is about, you know, treating optic, what you supposedly think of optic neuritis for about a few years before um, basically hammering down that diagnosis. Um, so I think, you know, with the rarity of this disease, it's still very difficult to diagnose. Um, but I think what's important to note is that, you know, with any concern um, of pathology, especially with um, symptoms that are not um, consistent with optic neuritis, it's important to, one, always get the MRI imaging at initial presentation and um, to make sure that, you know, it's read by uh, multiple radiologists and confirmed if it's not fully consistent. Um, I think what's also difficult about this, again, is this um, diagnosis is very elusive in the sense that patients typically have slow compression of the nerve itself, and so you'll have gradual decline in your visual acuity. Um, 
at times based on what, um, at times with the uh, diagnosis, you don't typically have to treat immediately, especially if they're not having known symptoms. Um, but the, for the, basically the main um, uh, treatment for this would then be uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, SRS, um, versus um, surgery itself. So um, there's a lot of studies out there that really confirm um, the use of fractionated um, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy to treat optic nerve sheath meningiomas. In this study, um, one of the larger studies um, to date um, done in Germany here, they had um, patients sampled from the 90s to 2005 with 109 patients, 113 eyes, um, with about 30% um, about of them being primary, um, primary meningiomas um, versus secondary. And um, we're all given uh, fractionated um, stereotactic radiotherapy at a dose of about 54 gray. Um, you can see here that there was um, relatively uh, good tumor control, um, about 100% um, within the first three years and also 98% in, in the following five years. Um, they typically had, um, patients typically had 30% um, of them showing visual deficits um, with it improving from 33% to about 20% uh, in, in that one eye affected. And then um, typically if there was um, contralateral visual deficits, um, there was an improvement from 10% to 6.7%, which was not necessarily um, significant, but important to note. Um, so I think what's important to know is that, you know, when you have this diagnosis of an optic nerve sheath meningioma, um, the idea of, you know, treatment is very standardized in the sense um, with an important referral to um, radiation oncology to assess, um, but still requires um, multidisciplinary discussion. And um, again, I think, you know, for our case, for our patient who had a secondary, possible secondary optic nerve sheath and meningioma, there are times um, that, you know, surgery can play a, a good role in it. And that's when, that depends on basically the presentation of the meningioma itself and um, the, the degree of an invasion they they have into that canal. So when um, when there's air evidence that, that there could be a safe dissection for an arachnoid plane, um, it's easy to then essentially peel off that um, mass itself um, versus when you have a primary um, meningioma, there's very poor surgical planes and difficulty um, to basically parse out the tumor itself versus the nerve, which causes a higher risk for um, permanent damage in the uh, optic nerve itself. Um, in this, in these secondary um, meningiomas, we've um, there's also better a better understanding of when surgery is appropriate. Is when you can um, basically stratify your cases into um, where the um, meningioma is compressing the nerve itself, versus uh, whether it being intraorbital, canicular, or in the um, in the cystic uh, cisternal portion of the optic nerve. Um, so typically, when it's not as um, fully invaded into um, the opti uh, into the orbit itself, there's uh, better uh, visualization in surgery and um, improved com decompression, especially in um, this, uh, this uh, review that stratified these cases showing that. Um, they um, they uh, did compression in the cisternal portion of the optic nerves for 50% uh, of the, um, excuse me, they had compression in the cisternal portion of the optic nerve showing 50% of the patients having improved acu acuity. And then, um, compression within the optic canal itself when it's present, only 31% of their patients had improved. And this is comp and when compression of the, in the intraorbital itself, there's only 11% improved. And this is um, accumulation of studies in a, a systematic, re uh, com systematic review um, that basically compiled all these patients across uh, multiple studies to assess this. And so for our patient here, you can see um, this is her MRI. Fortunately for her, as this is the post-op um, about in November, and we don't see, we did not see any evidence of um, extension into the optic nerve itself. Um, and it looks like the um, her recurrence has been pretty minimal at at least uh, three months from surgery. And this is the coronal, just to visualize the orbit. So this is a the coronal slice of the MRI orbits itself. So um, at this time, she's getting uh, stereotactic radiotherapy for her other meningiomas, 
and um, we're going to continue to follow up um, outpatient um, in clinic. Um, so that's um, all I have, but is there any questions you guys have? Mm -hmm. So I didn't see a specific comment on the reason why um, optic nerves is more misdiagnosed. Um, I think with compression, you can have, there could be a confusion of what patients are describing as headaches versus eye pain itself. It's, it, uh, it's in that paper, it is not clear how much they delve into the thinking behind the prior misdiagnoses, rather than this is the presenting, um, like the referral diagnosis. Yeah. And you know, I think that when somebody's making a referral, you know, and they're sort of shouting out to their person, "What's the diagnosis?" Uh, I don't know, bronchitis. Yeah. You know, it it it, it can be a little random. I was just curious about that systematic review. Um, they quantify, I think, 50% of patients with free visual acuity, uh, one location versus 31, 11%. I'm kind of curious if you knew whether or not they quantified that change in acuity or they looked at you know, how much they were staying. So I think, um, so this paper was a uh, neurosurgery based paper. So I think it was more, um, no, they didn't have the specific data of the acuity itself of how much there is improvement. I think. Um, it was unclear when in the review itself the threshold of what they did based on improvement in acuity. Um, it was a lot also based on what patients reported. So, I think that's the review itself. The um, irony of this microphone height is not lost on me for this ergonomics talk, and so I apologize. Tyler, how do you flip, how do you flip this again? Yeah, we're the same height, so I kind of All right, so I'm going to be talking about musculoskeletal injuries and musculoskeletal injury prevention, especially for ophthalmologists. So like Tyler, my journey with this started also as a third-year medical student, um, and ergonomics and surgery is something that I first heard about as a medical student on my general surgery rotation in a grand rounds presentation, which was very lucky, but also an atypical experience because when a group of general surgeons were surveyed, listed grand rounds is the least likely place to obtain ergonomic knowledge. Um, and I did not want that to be the case for the Moran. So I wanna just start with a brief representative case. This is Dr. C. She's a 33 year old ophthalmologist. She's one year into attending practice. She's caring, she's affable, she's not one to inconvenience a patient or a colleague. If a patient is sitting too low or to sitting too high, she goes low and looks up and vice versa. If the patient is too low, she goes high, cranes her neck over to see that far peripheral retina. When she comes home after a long day, she slumps into the couch, her neck aches, her back aches, but this is all a mark of an honest day's work. But five years into her career, she notices her right hand starting to get numb at the end of a long day of cases. Fast forward 10 years and she has persistent cervical and lumbar pain. She started cutting back her OR cases due to her pain burden and is starting to worry about her longevity and the career that she loves and works so hard to obtain. Eventually she goes for a scan 
to your surprise, she has multi-level degenerative changes in her cervical spine and also canal stenosis. And after another two years of trying to push through things, she just can't anymore and undergoes a cervical fusion and starts planning for an early retirement. Although this case is fictional, those cervical images are all from real prominent practicing ophthalmologists in America. And I worry that this story is coming to represent the arc of the modern ophthalmologist beginning even at the earliest stages of training. And that same fear is beginning to take root, I think in our community broadly, and perhaps editorial titles like this one are not overly sensational. I think we've known anecdotally for a long time that being a practicing physician places uh, strain on the body, but the first real documentation about musculoskeletal injury rates in ophthalmologists came about in the early 2000s. Since then, we've discovered that the rate of work-related musculoskeletal injury amongst ophthalmologists is about 50 to 75% of all ophthalmologists. And across all of those studies, approximately 15% of ophthalmologists plan to retire early due to musculoskeletal pain. And roughly 50% of ophthalmologists report decreased productivity due to musculoskeletal pain. We also know that proceduralists are at higher risk of developing musculoskeletal disorders. And this is because time spent in the OR, not age, height, or duration in practice, or time spent in clinic during the day is the best predictor of developing musculoskeletal pain. And eye care providers develop musculoskeletal pain at higher rates than our family medicine colleagues and other non-procedural colleagues. So the injury patterns we experience, most commonly the cervical spine as we hyperextend and flex our necks, sometimes with heavy headwear on, this produces muscular fatigue, there's discompression, degeneration, leading to things like cervical radiculopathy, articular surface degeneration, and canal stenosis. We hold our lenses and instruments in awkward positions for prolonged periods, causing micro ischemic injuries of the shoulder that lead to micro and eventually macro tears of the rotator cuff. We rest our elbows hard on hard tables, compressing the ulnar nerve, causing its sheath to inflame, thicken, and fibrose. Our wrist cock as we hold lenses and surgical instruments that we squeeze too hard. And we slump in our chairs, both when we are with patients, when we are documenting or sitting in grand rounds. In essence, all of these injuries can be boiled down to too much force over too much time with not enough healing and not enough prevention. The average head weighs 10 to 12 pounds, give or take. And the lightest indirect headset on the market weighs 1.1 pounds. If you remember back to your physics classes, the torque produced about a point by a weight on a lever arm and a gravitational field is multiplicative. So every pound at 60 degrees of anterior head tilt is being magnified by a factor of six at your cervical spine. So your 10 pound head produces a 60 pound force moment uh, at your cervical spine and your 1.1 pound headset is like hanging an additional six pound weight from your C-spine. I think we can all appreciate this is a significant amount of force, but how does that translate to chronic dysfunction at the level of the connective tissues, specifically the ligaments and the musculature? The next several slides show figures from a very elegant biomechanics study of the human supraspinous ligament that connects the apices of the spinous processes from about C7 to roughly L3 or L4. And what we can see is how tension within that ligament builds as it's loaded. So due to the heterogeneous lengths of collagen and elastin fibers that are in those ligaments, ligaments undergo a recruitment process where um, as the ligaments stretch, fibers are progressively recruited up into the point represented here by X3, where all the fibers are at maximum length and every additional bit of tension begins to build exponentially as force is applied and the ligament stretches. But this that was just showing the ligament during the loading phase at a set velocity and gives the illusion that these are purely elastic tissues. In reality, they're viscoelastic tissues and the tension in them produce, or produced in them rises as a function of the loading rate. So here on the left, what we see is that when we double the speed of ligament loading, the tension in the ligament is roughly 33% higher for the same amount of displacement meaning that moving quickly and moving slowly are not force equivalent processes for your ligaments. 
Additionally, when unloaded after an initial stretch, ligaments do not have perfect memory. They have hysteresis and they begin to slowly elongate over the course of prolonged or repetitive loading. So what this means um, is this progressive lengthening phenomenon is called creep in the musculoskeletal biomechanics space. So in this top figure, you can see that as a constant load is applied to the supraspinous ligament over a period of 20 minutes, say by your 10 pound head, leaning all the way forward during a cataract case, the length of that supraspinous ligament progressively increases, especially as small micro tears in the collagen begin to accumulate. And when you stop the case with this represented by this arrow here, even eight hours later, the length of that ligament has not returned to its native position. And over those eight hours, that ligament cannot perform its proper function of protecting your disc from the damaging effects of hyperflexion. Not only that, but the ligament is releasing inflammatory mediators as it stretches and tears that when transiently present are helpful in signaling the ligament to hypertrophy and become more robust, but when present chronically cause a host of deleterious effects and pain. And this bottom figure here shows that if you repeatedly load the ligament over time in multiple increments of loading, say 10 minutes at a time, like when you're doing cataract cases all day, the cumulative creep in those ligaments is even larger. We also know that ligaments are proprioceptive sensory organ. They relay their length and degree of stretch to the surrounding musculature to give those muscles information about how tense or relaxed they should be. So when you bend forward, all of those interspinous ligaments are sending information to the erector musculature in your neck and back to fire and help support the added weight of this anterior tilt. When we look at overlaid EMGs of the surrounding musculature during ligament loading, what we see is that the EMG signal jumps up quickly at time zero when the ligament starts to be loaded and then slowly tapers off as the ligament length starts to creep. But that taper is interrupted by small spasms that correlate temporally with micro tear formation in the ligament. Then at around 20 minutes here, when you stop loading the ligament, the EMG enters a phase of hyperexcitability where the muscle feels tired and is prone to spasm. After that, near the eight to 10 hour time point, there's a so-called morning after effect where the muscle tone is greatly increased and spastic, which is, which is why one may start to experience painful back spasms at the end of a long 24 hour call that persist all the way into the following morning or beyond. It is only after a period of prolonged rest, unfortunately, far longer than our interwork day time that the muscle tone returns to its functional baseline. So none of that's good and none of that is encouraging, which is why I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about prevention. So the National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety defines four drivers of work-related musculoskeletal injury. And really number three is the one that I view as the most modifiable. When I think of behavioral factors in our world, I think about ergonomics primarily, the way we move and position when we're working. And ergonomics are very powerful. A good way to prevent excessive loading on your ligaments is to not excessively load your ligaments by putting yourself in unnatural positions. The Academy agrees, and in 2017, they formed a task force on ergonomics that developed a course for ophthalmologists that I will link to you all. It's available on the Academy website and is something you can actually take for CME credit. This detailed presentation that they give has way more information in it than I can cover today. So I highly suggest that you review it on your own time, but I'll cover some of the more salient ergonomics points, starting with the use of the computer. I think this is all of us at some point or another throughout the day, back slouched, feet splayed out, Try to be mindful to have your computer screens at eye level, sit on the full seat, sit up straight, feet flat on the floor with the hips at 90 degrees. And the slit lamp too can be a biomechanically dangerous device as we alluded to before. Being able to get closer to the oculars is of primary importance to employ all the basic principles of good ergonomics. Elevate the patient so that their chair can clear under the footrest. And if available, trying to shorten your slit lamp table to allow yourself to get closer to the oculars or purchasing your own extenders or eyepiece angle adapters. You can also get longer head straps so that the patient can be closer to you. Also try to use a soft pad under the elbow when using lenses and try to avoid the use of a hard lens case. 
Don't shut down your carpal tunnel with hyperflexion or hyperextension when using your lenses. And, don't, and you don't need to crush those lenses with your fingers. With ophthalmoscopy, bring the patient to you as much as you can before bringing yourself to them. And in the operating room, set the eyepiece slightly below the eye height so you're not hyperextending or flexing. The ideal microscope ocular angle is about 20 degrees. Your wrist should be rested as to not rely on the shoulders for stability and your arm should be at 90 degrees. And foot pedal height should be leveled possibly with towels as to not cause asymmetric leg height and hip stress. Now ergonomics are fantastic and important part of the injury mitigation strategy, but they are not the whole story. And I really wanna focus on active prevention as well. So this is a kinematic motion analysis study that uses different mannequin positions for retinoscopy and refraction. And the results are kind of sobering because by changing mannequin position for optical ergonomics during retinoscopy and refraction, you can see that statistically, they were able to reduce the time in a non-neutral neck position, but it's maybe a 10% overall reduction at best. I would argue that this change would be more profound for more static tasks like slit lamp exams, but regardless, ergonomics are not the whole story and they only get us part of the way there. An ideal positioning at all times is an unrealistic goal. We all come in all shapes and sizes and we're going to have to make some positioning concessions in order to work and operate together. And for that reason, we need active modalities as well that are going to allow for musculoskeletal strengthening and ligamentous hypertrophy that are going to buffer us through some of those inevitable moments of strain. So to this end, I'll be sending out a guide to everyone with a whole series of resources and exercises that I have compiled through my journey trying to overcome some of my own biomechanics issues and things I learned during the recovery from a lumbar spine fracture that I had in college amongst many other injuries. I don't have time to go through the exercise individually here, but my intention with the guide is to have a central resource where people can compile ideas to come up with a focus routine that works for them, that they do for maybe 10 minutes a day or even 10 minutes three times a week or once a week. This is not intended to be a no pain, no gain guide. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And if you have a pre-existing musculoskeletal problem, you should seek out professional guidance from a physical therapist prior to starting a regimen. In the, in the last several minutes here, I'll just touch on some of the most high yield resources um, that will be in this guide. So I think that the AAO ergonomics best practice course that was mentioned above is a great starting point. They have a variety of introductory strengthening and mobility exercises for the upper extremities, C-spine and the low back. And I think that even if you just did these things and nothing else, you would see a great benefit from that. This is another good one. This is an in-office yoga sequence that's made by Drs. Palma and Gottlieb. It's available through the Academy, and I will also link it in the guide. And it is ophthalmology tailored, and it may give you some useful ideas for things that you can do in the privacy of an exam room or in your office. And I think this is one of the most high yield resources that I have used. Um, so Peter Atia is a Hopkins NIH trained trauma surgeon and surgical oncologist who has now moved into kind of the longevity and prevention space. And he has a whole seven part series um, on YouTube that has a whole host of cervical, thoracic and upper extremity exercises that are designed to combat much of the anterior head tilt and chest tightening that we uh, are plagued by as clinicians and surgeons. Um, and then one of the physical therapists that I worked with as an undergraduate um, had gone through Princeton's athletic training program and shared with me this amazing guide, which I will link as, uh, to you all as well, um, that has a huge selection of lumbar mobility and strengthening exercises that are stratified into beginner and more advanced categories. And uh, lastly, Dr. McGill, um, Stuart McGill in Canada, he's one of the preeminent spine biomechanics researchers in the world. He's published hundreds of papers on spine injury and prevention. And over the years has kind of uh, distilled out or identified three exercises that he considers the most safe and high yield for preventing back injury and for stabilizing the L-spine, the so-called big three, and instructions regarding how to do those and at what interval will be provided in the guide as well. And my last bit of advice would just be to just get out and move as much as you can. We're blessed to live in a place like this and have a culture that values motion. This is one of our former retina fellows, Joe Simonet, booting it up one of the uh, coulars in the central Wasatch. 
I just want to say a special thanks to Amy Lynn for talking over some of this stuff with me. And then also my dear friend, Tom Hoban, um, who's a physical therapist back in Rhode Island, who sent me a bunch of videos of himself um, in his clinic doing various things to help uh, in construction of this guide. So thank you. it into our training, you know, versus adding additional things on like Taco Tuesday and kind of the stress of having a wellness thing in addition to not actually having time off for wellness kind of relating to the Tyler study versus our own accountability. How, how would you try and navigate that process if you're building it from scratch? Yeah, I think that's very I think what going to the guy would be kind of of a line you kind of build and program that I do is something that people do on their own. Have different age games or has a different goal of these kinds of things. Um, I think it's difficult at the cost of these things, like things that are um, the stretches. So, but I would stress that one one quote that always um, it's really stuck with me is LeBron James spends $1.5 million dollars here on health prevention. That's because it's worth it. And like this really is a huge investment in your future. And if you are you know losing five years of your career. Yeah, I was just curious to talk a lot about the structural impediments that happens when you're in these awkward positions. How does that um, pathological stretching that you're kind of referring to compare to the good stretching you know, like the exercise you're doing, or even like the yoga or the professional things you're doing? Yeah, it kind of has to actually do with a lot of the inflammatory mediators that are released. So, and the duration of time that your tissues are exposed to that. So if you look at ligamentous loading, the um, kind of pro-inflammatory factors that are, that are released in kind of the first six minutes of that ligament being loaded are actually pro-growth, pro-hypertrophy. And after about that six minute time point, we start releasing uh, inflammatory factors that more to ligamentous degeneration um, than anything. So it's really, being loaded for too much time. And that's why kind of doing incremental exercise where you're kind of within that loading period where you're releasing good kind of pro-inflammatory mediators. And then I do have a second question for those of us like you and I who are outside the standard deviation of the average height. Um, is there any like place or resources for even additional for other adaptive things you can use to move your yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna put a lot of that individual like shares and things like that. So I'll send all that out um, over the weekend. It's almost Jordan, I know this is an interest to you because obviously you're a setup for this happening being a college resident attending. Um, one of the things that's gonna be really helpful down the road for you younger guys is that companies are looking at making getting rid of microphones to make the heads up displays that act microphones. That's going to take away a lot of these issues. There's a company in Israel that took the heads up display from the fighter pilots and is incorporating them into a microscope view where you'll literally put on a, a VCR headset and operate through that instead of being at the microscope and putting your feet underneath and on the pedals. So I think there's going to be technology that's going to help you guys a lot to try to prevent this. And, and you know, when you're in the operating room, you know, it, it, just takes that extra 10 seconds to set everything up ahead of time so that you've got good posture to begin with. And I think we don't stress that enough as attendees. We want to, you know, when you guys are getting set up to do that, we really want to stress good positioning, your legs, your feet, your hips, your neck. And so if we're not doing that, please take the extra time when we're doing surgery to do that. Because anything that you do now is going to help you 30 years from now. I think Ethan, did you say there was one online, one question? Yeah, there's there's two on the chat. Right, there's, three now. there's three on the chat now. All right. Um, yeah, I would just say also, um, just it, the, the uh, dilemma for me has always been taking that extra little bit of time 
to make sure I'm comfortable at this lit lamp or whatever it is. And I have to say, I kind of always go for the, the time. I mean, I just kind of, I have adapted my body to fit everything else. And, um, it does take its toll over the years. So if you can just convince yourself kind of to, to take that extra bit of time, it's like putting on your mask on the airplane, you know, first, if you don't take care of yourself, you know, later on, you won't be able to take care of your people. So still working on it. Um, will you consider putting this guy on the main board? Yes, absolutely. I think we're going to have to hear anything about the best, where the best place to put this would be, and I think that would be uh, excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone. Awesome. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you. Uh, Jordan, for the great presentation, obviously, very important discussion. Um, looking forward to having those resources kind of uh, in our hands and online as well. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We'll be signing off. Thank you.